welcome to another edition of Conversations with Claire. It's an honor for me to interview some of today's most important leaders that are tackling the challenges of today's world and from whom we all can learn. Today, I had the honor of being joined by Dr. Tony Fauci, who is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Dr. Fauci, thank you for joining me today. We're Good to in be Aspen, with you. Colorado. Yeah and at the Aspen Health Festival. And you and I just raced back to sit down here after being part of a panel on eliminating HIV. And I thought it would be really nice to continue that conversation. So are you up for that? Certainly, let's do it. That's great. Now, I haven't known you in person that long, although I do believe that I got to meet you the first time in the mid 1980s, but you're one of the people who have been part of trying to tackle the HIV epidemic, actually maybe even started to tackle it before we knew what HIV was and that it was HIV. And tremendous progress has been made and a lot has been changed. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what has been changed, the progress we have made, right. and then the next steps that we have ahead of us. Yeah, I mean, for, for better or worse, I, I was involved with it uh, literally from the very first month when the first cases were reported by the CDC in the summer of 1981. And I, at that point, made a, a rather abrupt transition in my career. I decided that I was going to start studying this disease that didn't have a name. It was inappropriately called gay-related immunodeficiency, and it certainly didn't have an etiology. And we were kind of like swimming in the dark. So the only thing we did was observational. We would bring in these very critically and desperately ill mostly gay young men, and start to study them to understand what the, what the pathogenesis of this strange disease was. That was in 1981. What has happened between 1981 and now is an extraordinary uh, journey uh, of science, implementation, understanding about a variety of social issues that we never really integrated into medicine. So for the first years, it was really the dark years of, of my life and my, my medical career because we couldn't do anything but essentially put Band-Aids on hemorrhages. We, we were able to treat some of the opportunistic infections, but when you started to treat an infection and you didn't get the underlying cause, yeah. the next infection would get right. them. So it was very frustrating. When I first started taking care of patients, the median survival since we saw them only after they had advanced disease because they had no way of knowing they were infected and they would only come in when they were very sick. The median survival was about 12 months, which was desperate, terrible, which means 50% of the patients would be dead in 12 months and probably 95% would, would be dead in a couple of years. And then what happened is that once the etiology, etiologic agent was found in 1983 and proven to be the cause in 1984, then we started doing two things. We started doing general testing because we had a diagnostic test. And that was stunning because we realized that there was infinitely more people infected than what we were seeing with advanced disease. We were seeing the tip of the iceberg. Then the next thing that happened is that now that we had the agent, we started developing drugs. So from 1987, when AZT was first identified as the first drug, and then over the years until 1996, when we developed the triple combination that for the first time actually dropped the level of virus to below detectable and kept it there. And then ever since then, we've been doing better and better with better drugs so that now, today, we have amazing, breathtaking advances that if you treat somebody who's infected and you keep them on therapy and keep the viral load to below detectable level, not only do you save their life and they can essentially live an almost normal life, you could add almost a normal lifespan. So if you get someone in their 20s and treat them, right. you could get them to get an additional 50 years to live. And then we have pre-exposure prophylaxis, which means if you're at risk and you take a single pill a day, you decrease by 97% the chance that you will be acquiring infection. You put those two things together, right now, with the breathtaking scientific advances, now we have an implementation challenge because theoretically, if we implemented all of these things to their fullest, you could theoretically end the epidemic in the United States and globally. But we don't live in a theoretical world, we live in a real world, and that's the current challenge. We still need to make scientific advances. We still need a cure, we still need a vaccine. But the profound advances that we've made in science now 
have now opened the door for us to essentially go out and implement, which is going to have to now confront a lot of social determinant issues, stigma, inaccessibility to health care, those are the kind of things. So it went from a mystery of not even knowing what we're dealing with to very effective tools with the challenge of now implementing those tools. And the other part that I find fascinating about it, it also has brought people together that otherwise never might have been in touch with each other, right? right. Within the scientific community, but also the outreach that all of us have to yeah. engage in to be part of the community. And I bet you when you first started working on all of this, your daily life looked very different than it looks today. Oh, for sure. I mean, back then, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, I, I would say antiquated <laughs> in the sense that there was the scientific community, the regulatory community, and the people who were sick or at risk. And they didn't interact very much, almost from a top-down area. Then it became clear, largely due to the activist movement, groups like uh, Treatment Action Group, mm -hmm. like ACT UP, like Project Inform, who went out and really demanded to have an interaction between the scientific and the regulatory community and the people in the trenches, the community people. That was totally transforming because that changed how scientists interact in implementing their advances at the community level. So you would never have seen back in the 1970s the very close interaction between the highbrow scientists, as it were, and the regulatory agencies in the community. Now, it's an integral part of everything we do. So given all those changes and given how far we have come and thinking about PrEP today, which maybe you can talk a little bit about, I'm really curious to hear your perspective on the ambition that we all share with President Trump in terms of truly trying to get to a point where we could start talking about maybe even during our lifetime experiencing eliminating HIV. Well, certainly ending it as an epidemiological phenomenon. Right now, even though we have a degree of complacency due to very important successes, we still have 38,000 new infections each year in the United States, which in and of itself is horrible that we have so many infections. Mm -hmm. The thing that's even more frustrating about it, it's been that way for 10 or 15 yeah. years. It's gone down a little bit, but not really substantially. So within that context, we decided that if you look at the United States, we have demographically and geographically focused areas where most of the infections are occurring. That doesn't mean you want to neglect the other areas, but you look at the United States, we have a, a very specialized type of an outbreak. 13% of the population in the United States is African American. Almost 50% of the new infections are among African Americans. 65% among men who have sex with men. 75% among young people. Mm -hmm. So if you look at young African American, Latino, transgender, men who have sex with men, and look at that group, that's a demographically concentrated group. Then if you look at the country as a whole, I was stunned when I saw these data that there are 3,007 counties in the United States. So if you put the map of the United States up, all these little boxes, they add up to 3,007 counties. 48 of those counties, plus the District of Columbia, plus San Juan, Puerto Rico, account for more than 50% of the new infections in the country. And seven southern states have a high concentration in rural areas. So now that we look at that, we feel that given the tools that we have, if we aggressively implement that and involve the community, the plan, hopefully, would be to decrease the number of new infections by 75% in five years and by 90% in 10 years, to go from 38,000 to 3,000 or less. If we do that, that would, in effect, end the epidemic. It wouldn't get rid of HIV because we still have to treat all the people that we're bringing in and diagnosing. But as an epidemic, we would end it. And we have learned so much. So I'm very proud that my colleagues at the Wallen School of Public Health at Emory developed something called AIDS View. Mm. Play on words, it's VU, but it sounds like VIEW, where you can literally see all the maps that you talked about and get a really good sense of where the epidemic is, who the people are in terms of, of their age, their uh, race, the neighborhoods, the characteristics of the neighborhoods. You mentioned the term social determinants of health. 
And um, we also know that a lot of the cases, you talked about the 47, no, the 48, 48, 48 counties, and talked about the seven southern states. We also know that a lot of the new diagnoses are in rural areas, right. which is very different from the way the epidemic has been. Does that pose special challenges right. for the research that we need to do it, it, today? It, it, it poses special challenge for the implementation research. Right. The innovation research, you want a vaccine for everyone who needs it, you want a cure for everyone who's infected. But the special challenge of what you're talking about, about the rural areas, is one of overcoming the double and triple whammy of stigma that is in those areas. Because you're talking about individuals, mostly African-American, men who have sex with men who live in the South. So they have discrimination and stigma against them. We've got to engage the community, the, the faith-based community, community organizations, community workers, to get in there and make it easy for those individuals to be able to get into programs for prevention and treatment. That is a different challenge than doing it in the middle of San Francisco or in the middle of New York City or in the middle of Washington, D.C. So there's a special challenge of implementation. If you were a young scientist yourself, or maybe let's make it more realistic, if you had some young scientists who would come to you and say, I want to do the research that's going to be as game-changing as some of the work that you and others have done, what, would advi what advice would you give them? Well, you know, it depends. If you wanted to do pure innovation research, I would steer them towards developing a vaccine, developing mm -hmm. either a cure or a way to get away from having to take a medicine every single day. And we're working on long-acting antiretrovirals, passive transfer of monoclonal antibodies. So if you're a fundamental scientist and you want innovation, I would suggest that. If you were interesting in public health impact type of research, I think there's so much to be done on implementation research to figure out how we can best implement the tools that we have. To me, that's very exciting. So when people come to me and say, you know, I'm not interested in bench work, I'm not really interested necessarily in a clinical trial, I really want to do something to impact the epidemic. I think that kind of implementation science is very exciting. I wish I was young and you were my mentor. <laughs> um, you mentioned the word vaccine. Do you think that during our lifetime we'll get to a point where there might be a vaccine? You know, I do, but I think people need to understand that it's unlikely to be a vaccine that's going to be like a polio or a measles mm -hmm. vaccine, which is 95, 97% effective. Given the special nature of HIV and the fact that the body doesn't make a very good immune response against it, I believe we will have a vaccine. We had one vaccine trial we did in Thailand that was modestly not effective, 31%, not really ready for prime time or for deployment. We have a couple of trials going on in Africa right now, two or three trials, that if in fact those trials have an effect, even if it's 50, 55%, I think that would be a major advance. So I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll get a vaccine, but I'm realistic enough to know that I don't think it's gonna be one of those slam dunk vaccines that completely protects you against infection. What excites me is that you're telling me it's not an illusion. No, it's no, it's not an illusion. It's something we just need to be focused on and it absolutely. will make a difference. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Dr. Fauci, I've been the one asking you lots of questions. Is there something you wish that I had asked about or that you would like to share? Well, no, I, I think you hit all the appropriate uh, questions. I think that what, what I was struck by is what we experienced in the uh, panel that we were on together just today, is the diminution of general public interest in HIV AIDS, likely because of our successes. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems when you're dealing with a public health challenge, be it HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, is that when you get a degree of success and you take away the acute anxiety associated with, the general public tends to have their interest in other places. So I think it's important to point out that, and the question that I'm asking you to ask me, is that what about the general attitude in this country? When I was testifying, and I testify a lot before the Congress, too. when I was testifying before the Congress in the late 80s, the early 90s, there were TV cameras, C-SPAN, CNN, everybody focusing in what I was talking about, about HIV. I was highly interested in it for the general public. 
Now when I testify before Congress, I hardly get asked a question about HIV. It's because they feel that we've done very well, so let's move on to another mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. That's dangerous because when you think you've solved the problem and you haven't completely solved it, then it can then wind up getting out of hand. And that's what we don't want to see, either in the United States or globally in places like Africa. And complacency, complacency is our biggest enemy. Oh, then, it absolutely right? is. Yes. Yeah. And that's one of the challenges of making the kind of progress we have and making sure that not only those of us in the trenches, but that the rest of society understands progress is not the same as having a solution. Right. Well, I very much appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. I know you have many other things you need to accomplish, including catching a flight back to <laughs> D.C. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Good to be with you.